behold, I shall be a blight upon the land, and everything I touch shall wither and die. Blight. It's hard to go wrong when you have a glowing green radioactive skeleton design. And Blight would go on to become an iconic villain for the Batman Beyond series, despite initially only appearing for six episodes in the first season. The story of Derek Powers and his transformation into Blight is a strong one, but also one that lends itself very well to an ending. By the time his arc concludes in the Batman Beyond series, it's a very natural endpoint for the character, not just narratively, but thematically. And yet he would return post that, both in the DCAU canon and comic book form, and in the DC universe itself. That being the DCU main comic first continuity. And yet few of any of these appearances achieved the same resonance that his first appearance had. In this retrospective, we're going to take a look at Blight, what makes him work so well, and why it's hard to bring him back in a way that makes a solid impact or feels worthwhile. I'm Sasha, this is Casually Comics, and let's get started. Yes, I wore a radioactive wig for this. <laughs> The character of Derek Powers debuts in the first episode of Batman Beyond Rebirth Part 1 from 1999. He was created by Bruce Timm and Paul Dini, Dini being one of the writers of the episode alongside Alan Burnett. Established early in this episode is Powers' background as a businessman, entering into partnership with Bruce Wayne, causing the company to become Wayne Powers Enterprises. When we have our time jump after Bruce stops being Batman, we quickly learn that superpowers or no, Powers is already a villain. With Wayne very much checked out from Gotham's affairs, both as Batman and as Bruce Wayne, Derek Powers was able to steer the company into a more shady direction. There is no cure. Extreme heat or radiation, but at this stage it's obviously not an option. Dust to dust. Our first encounter with Powers lets us know that he's doing things like try and develop and traffic nerve agents. And we also glean his personality, which is smooth, cold, arrogant, and calculating. The menace is there, but it's couched beneath the veneer of etiquette and control. In some ways, it's very similar to the persona that Lex Luthor puts forth to the world, which is pretty fitting as Powers' voice actor Sherman Howard portrayed Lex on the Superboy series. The trajectory is quickly set for Powers and the eventual Batman Terry McGinnis to cross paths. This intersection forms when Terry's father, a Wayne Powers employee, stumbles upon the nerve gas plot, resulting in his murder, which is framed as a hit by the Joker's gang. By this point, Terry had already encountered Bruce Wayne and discovered his secret that he was Batman. So both characters are, even though their fates are linked, already on the paths that they are destined for. So it creates a looser and less direct, I created you type of relationship that sometimes these hero antagonist roles can fall into. It's more that the city itself and the evolution course that is taken without Batman has set this up. But there is also enough of an emotional stake that creates a compelling emotional connection. And it's understandable why each character would feel resentment towards the other. Hello, Terry. Ever had a ride in a limo? My dad always told me to never take rides from strangers. Who's a stranger? Besides, your dad's not around anymore. Rebirth Part 2 is where both characters start to sell into the roles they will occupy. While Terry will take much longer to fully come into his own as Batman, Pyrus' transformation into Blight is far more stark by contrast. In a battle trying to stop the shipment of nerve gas, Pyrus ends up being exposed to it. It's a very intense moment, as we've seen, slash it's been heavily implied, how horrible it is to die this way. So in a desperate attempt to save his life, Pyrus resorts to a tried and true comic book method. Radiation. Lots and lots of radiation. At least 85% of the time you get powers. What a bargain. They do a little homage to the scene in 1989's Batman by Tim Burton, where Joker first asks for the mirror to see himself post-chemical accident. There's a nice reveal here in Rebirth Part 2, where at first it looks as though his skin may be fine, and then they cut off the lights that they're using, and you can see that he's just glowing, and he's just this gleaming green skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about this moment is that it works very well, not just with the visuals and the way it's all laid out, but also for the fact that this is a culmination of Powers' own actions. This is largely his own fault. He just shoots the canister the Batman throws, so it's this interesting mutual moment. He'll blame it on Batman, but it's his. It was his own choices that led to this outcome and have now set him on a path that will align exceptionally well with his eventual villain moniker of Blight. And that is the path of slow decay, deterioration. For the rest of his time in the series, Powers will be on a first subtle and then quite 
rapid on all levels decline, personally, professionally, health-wise, stability. For this treatment and the synth layer of skin they've encased him in is just a stopgap measure. He's dying. He was dead the moment the nerve gas hit him. And now it's just this slow process prolonged by radiation. But it's clever for the viewer as well because at first it's not quite evident that that's where this plot is going because you have the expectation given comic book and superhero tropes that the villain may just be changed. This is just his new form and he'll be fine. Only with this story, it progresses. It takes that trope and plays with it. That's part of what made the Batman Beyond series and its characters in general quite compelling. They would grow and change. The only thing is for some, that would lead more interesting directions or they would have more room to grow, whereas for others, it was less interesting or they were headed towards a clear conclusion. Or even if not necessarily a clear one, they appeared to have a natural end point. We next see Powers in the episode Blackout, which introduces another Batman Beyond villain, Ink. And at first, he seems entirely normal. He's just fishing. I'll send him an extra basket of oranges this Christmas and he'll be happy. Moving on. Here's what I'd like you to do tonight, my dear. But this is a result of the synth skin that he's wearing. Hard to say, synth skin. This is giving him the appearance of normalcy while also containing his radioactivity, but he's not stable. I don't know. He wore a costume, black and red. Batman. The Batman? What difference does it make? What's happening to you? I have a condition. I trust you'll be discreet. So while Powers is deteriorating, it's not to the point where it appears that it will permanently hinder him. He's still a threat to Gotham and Batman on a behind the scenes level. And it feels as though his volatile nature lurking underneath is something even more dangerous for Batman to contend with at a later date. Like it could be something that'll make him stronger and not weaker, which is fueled in the episode Meltdown, which also proves to be the last on-screen appearance of the DCAU's Mr. Freeze. Here, Blight is fully unmasked as it were, where we see him frozen by Freeze, but he bursts out because, well, he's radioactive, and it seems that he's very much embracing and enjoying his powers, even naming himself as Blight. This is the first full appearance of powers in this form since the brief glimpse at the end of Rebirth Part 2. But we also see that he's becoming more and more divorced from the man that he was, and that already wasn't a good man to begin with. It's becoming harder and harder to maintain that he hasn't changed. We also brought these, just in case you were cold. You are idiots. His penultimate appearance in Shriek plays with the more businessman aspect of his personality as he employs the villain, Shriek, to attempt to drive Bruce Wayne insane by faking auditory hallucinations because since the end of Rebirth, Bruce had been attempting to take more of an interest in the company and steer it back in a proper direction. He's extra galvanized this episode because Powers wants to tear down Crime Alley. We can't have that. Where will he go to have angst? That is actually a very poetic episode, seeing how much of the new Gotham is literally built on top of the old. This episode very much proves to be the calm before the storm when it comes the blight because you don't see a blight moment in this episode it's the only one since his transformation where you don't have anything peeking through but then there's the next episode where blight appears ascension which is also season one's finale which places powers's arc in the position of bookending the first season there had of course been hints throughout the season that powers was getting worse and it's now firmly established he's burning hotter and these skins aren't lasting half as long and he's running out of the ability to obtain the materials he needs through legal means and so he's starting to go outside of them this as blight Blight. Essentially, he's headed towards a meltdown. And because he's committing these crimes in his Blight form, this leads Terry and Bruce begin to think that there's a link between Blight and Wayne Powers. This together with Powers' penchant for employing and throwing supervillains at them, it's a logical assumption on their part. The idea that maybe he's bankrolling Blight rather than the idea that he is Blight. So once again, it's Powers' own actions that are ensnaring him. His emotional stability is also rapidly deteriorating. He's just prone to emotional outbursts and fits of anger, and those help destroy the skin. This episode also had some humanizing moments for Powers, while showcasing some darker ones for Terry. So he decides to call his son, Paxton Powers. He's getting a nice alliteration in there. But ultimately it's too late. When confronted with Wayne Powers as a polluter, he snaps and transforms in front of everyone and the secret is revealed. Whoa, Powers is blight. Now, Terry does not have the reaction that Bruce expected when he's first told that it's kind of sort of his fault, but not really, but he is the catalyst for this transformation. As at the end, it was him that exposed powers to the nerve gas. You mean I made him that? You may have, in part. Good. 
This goes a long way in highlighting that Terry is still on a very different part of his Batman journey, and he still has a lot of anger. And it's also linking it back to those very first episodes. Him teaming up and being sought out by Paxton also highlights a through line that is integral to Batman Beyond as a whole, which is legacy. Bruce and Derek represent different elements of the old Gotham, as Gotham is now literally named Neo-Gotham. And as mentioned in many cases, parts of it are built on top of the old. While Terry and Paxton, even though the latter just rolled on up, represent the new, and both have been shaped by not just their respective father figures, they're also shaped by the city itself. In this episode, Terry ultimately embraces the legacy of Batman, in that when Paxton betrays his father and seeks to kill him, he can't go through with it, despite all the hatred he harbors towards him. While Paxton's very betrayal of powers highlights that Blight had a very apt name indeed. Just by his very nature, even pre-transformation, Powers had poisoned his own son against him, and created yet another corrupt and villainous person. So in a way, even though he's here betraying his father, he's also embracing that legacy. But he'd also been poisoning the city, both literally and metaphorically, and his personal relationships much longer. The name just works on so many levels. It's a great name. This episode this episode also plays with another homage to Burton's Batman, when Terry confronts Blight on the submarine. This is where Blight is hiding out, dramatically on a submarine. Comes in and tells him that he killed his father, to which Blight says, Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? This became a small meme for a little bit, but it also serves to underscore that their connection, while personal, it still has that bit of indirectness to it. And yet all the actions they would have taken anyway have led them to this moment. It's very strong character writing. Powers goes nuclear and goes down with the ship. Sub. And while they leave it open-ended, the implication is very strong that he died. One of the writers, Robert Goodman, explained that they didn't bring him back because they felt that his story had reached its natural conclusion. Terry was now in a place where he was more at peace with the emotional trauma, and he'd let go of some of that anger. So the brunt of that emotional connection was now blunted, especially since Powers had no idea who Terry was. Plus, Powers had left many a villain in his wake. He'd set up his son, Paxton, who didn't ultimately prove to do much, but he was there. He'd introduced Ink and Shriek into the series. So he'd left villains behind in his wake that go on to provide Batman with some interesting stories. Also, by having him appear so few times in the series as a whole, although he does appear a lot for the first season, he doesn't wear out his welcome. His plots don't get a chance to become tired or played out. You get a trying to oust Bruce from the company plot, hiring people to take on Batman, twice, his powers out of control, twice, and none of them wear out their welcome because they're varied. And even the ones that are starting to repeat some elements are presented uniquely. But if he had lingered, would that have remained the case? Based on his later appearances, chances point to no. There are of course a few things that don't hit as hard as they could have or that they don't really play with, such as the Dr. Phosphorus element, which is there. And some people point out that he's very much a fusion of Dr. Phosphorus and Lex Luthor, and that's not entirely inaccurate. They combine well in the way they utilize him in this series to form something more unique, but mild may vary. They could have played more with the whole him being toxic element, even potentially creating some other villains that way. But on the whole, Ascension is a strong ending for powers. Destroyed by his his own greed and the poison that he himself had been trying to produce. In short, he did it to himself, and that's why it really hurts. While Blight did not return on screen, time of recording, he did return to the pages of comics. First from the Batman Beyond tie-in comic series. The ongoing that ran from 1999 to 2001 had 24 issues. He returns in issue 18 from 2001, written by Hilary J. Botter, with art by Craig Russo, inks by Rob Lee, and colors by Patricia Mulvihill. This was not the first issue to play with the whole he died on the sub element. Issue 8 brought back the character who it was implied that he was having an affair with, and she became a villain and named herself Vendetta, and she wanted revenge for them letting him die on that submarine. How dare they? But issue 18 sees the return of Blight, and it's mostly a hunter plot, where the hunter injects Terry with a dart bearing a specific radiation signature. Why? Because Powers survived, and now he must absorb radiation to live. Which was not his prior MO, and in fact runs directly counter to it, as before he needed a cure because his body was deteriorating because of the radiation and the fact that it commingled with the nerve gas. Now he's forgotten who he is and just hungers for radiation. Terry is able to prompt his memory later when they do battle, but that just makes him angrier and results in a you made me this way fight. Terry is able to encase him in some molten lead, and then the hunter knocks Terry out and he takes his nice molten lead Blight statue to a cave and sits around and looks at it like the Predator. Blight was such a thematically strong and poetic in many ways villain that to have him come back as a generic energy or radiation sucking monster feels like a bit of a come down. This story didn't have to feature Blight for it to work. It could have been 
anybody seeking radiation. Just that the hunter wanted this very specific, unique trophy. And the story would have had about the same amount of impact, because it's not the strongest hunter story either. This is not referenced again, which is a common theme with these Blight revisits. Most of the time, they take you straight back to the submarine. When in doubt, head back to the sub. In 2010, after years of not being published, DC decided to try and bring back a Batman Beyond series. But this one will be more integrated with the overall DC continuity, a kind of fusion of certain elements. But it would still largely focus on and remain in and expand the DCAU one. After a successful mini under Adam Beechin, an ongoing was commissioned, which began in January of 2011. This version of the series did not last long, but was later relaunched in 2012 with a strong focus on a digital initiative. This 2011 series would also see the return of Blight, this in issue 5, and then he would remain until issue 7. In issue 5, we see him bailing out his son of prison anonymously, before it's revealed that he's deteriorated even further, and now he requires a containment suit to maintain integrity. His plan, kill his son, also Batman, stage it at a Wayne Enterprises facility and just devalue the company, cause all kinds of unrest, and then seize it back. In any case, time to look to the future. Tomorrow, the market will open. Between news of this explosion and yesterday's riot, consumer confidence in Wayne Powers will keep dropping like a rock, and stocks will sink to all-time lows. And the money I had sitting in those offshore accounts before I went away will come in nice and handy, and in no time at all, I'll be back in business. In this version, Blight is shown to be more delusional. He's not mindless, he remembers who he is, but he's hyper-focused on this idea that he can reclaim the company and run it, even though he's dying and deteriorating, but that in no way is his focus. There will be time later to find a more permanent, stable means of keeping me alive. I've come a long way to this point, to the verge of getting back Wayne Powers, the company that is rightfully mine. And I'm not about to let a bad suit of clothes ruin the moment. So just how did he survive the submarine? Well, his condition led him to a point where he no longer needed to sleep or eat or drink or breathe. Even though we saw him eating an ascension very shortly before he sank, there's this silly scene that I adore where he happily eats a sandwich and they manage to draw a smile onto his face while he's eating it. Don't think about that, unless it's for fun, which I sometimes do. I love that scene, it's just so happy. <laughs> nom 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 nom. Anyway, under the sub, he sat there, seething with rage. Hating the Who's, I mean Batman. And eventually was able to crawl out to seek vengeance. Locating a doctor who used to work for him, he fashioned this containment suit, and now he's ready for revenge. These issues are written by Beach and with art by Ryan Benjamin. Inks by John Sinitsky and colors David Barron. There are lots of businessman jokes in these issues. Side note, the cover of issue 7 is just great. This suit is not stable. It can't contain Powers' radiation levels, which are still accelerating, fluctuating. It's too much. He can not be contained. If he doesn't get everything solved and patched up, he's going to dissolve into an ooze, just a paste. Some sort of resting agent, yes. So predictable. You must think I'm an idiot, Batman. I'm smart enough to have nearly conquered the world through business before you and Bruce Wayne stole it from me. Did you know that Derek Powers was a businessman? <laughs> I'm so glad this comic told me. You're a lousy dad who tried to have his own son framed and murdered. Face it, Powers, you're not a man. You're nothing but an empty suit of clothes. That's nice, Terry, but try insulting his business acumen. He clearly cares about that more. Also, he's goo now. And that was all for Blight and this iteration of Batman Beyond Continuity. For the rest of it, he'll be referenced in flashbacks or on a computer screen, things like that. They bring him back seemingly for want of an iconic villain, but a lot of what worked for him has been stripped away. The containment suit takes away some of that sleek, distinct look he had. Now, a green skeleton is admittedly hardly a revolutionary design, but the way that they combined it with the remnants of his suit and just the sleekness of the animation style overall, and the fact that you so rarely saw him in that form for long periods of time, it helped him stand out more. It made the look feel a bit more iconic. Once more, here, he feels a bit generic. All the jokes about being a businessman and how clearly unhinged he is make him feel more like a joke than a powerhouse. It's fine, but also it would have been fine if he didn't return. It still doesn't match the gravitas of his first arc. Now, some would argue that it doesn't have to, that villains should show up and be used as needed. While it could also be argued he wasn't needed, and that's okay to either let certain characters fade away or only really pull them out if you have something very strong for them. This was also a tiny bit of a rehash because we're back to the whole I need to take the company from Bruce Wayne plot, but it's nowhere near as clever or sinister as the first one. And that jump to how much he aggressively hates Bruce feels a bit unearned, though of course you could attribute that to his deteriorating mental state. Trap beneath a sub with only hatred and memories of a mediocre sandwich. I mean, I don't know if it was mediocre, maybe it was amazing. Look at how happy he is. That's how to be a sandwich for the ages. 
DC Comics plays with its continuity, oft times some would argue more than it needs to. Batman Beyond Rebirth is a good example of this. While the New 52 versions of Batman Beyond have been working on a fusion-style logic of DCAU and DCU leaning towards the DCAU, Rebirth decided that it was going to put Batman Beyond entirely into the DCU continuity, so the main verse. You know what that means. Everybody back to the submarine. And we're keeping the containment suit, and this time it's going to look even more like Mr. Freeze's. Now, Powers' past is a bit different here, and they do flesh out some details that make it line up with the DCU and how events were happening there. Like now, the merging of Wayne Enterprises occurs because of the Brother Eye conflict. And he now worked very closely with Warren McGinnis, and they're more contemporaries. He's tied more to Batman Bruce Wayne than to Terry, despite still having killed Terry's father. There's just more of a focus on Bruce here in general in this series. They do still focus on Terry, but there's a lot of characters to juggle. It's in one of his dark side labs that Powers had that Bruce couldn't detect for reasons that he has his accident and becomes blight. Now sometimes this continuity wanted to have its cake and eat it too, so while it would introduce a whole bunch of new elements from the DCU, it would also sometimes just leave you to assume that events had occurred the exact same way as they had in the DCAU. So if you weren't familiar with that, sometimes you would get some very rushed cliff notes. They do this when they detail some of what happened in Rebirth. Enough to give you the impression that after his transformation into Blight, things were pretty much the same as they occurred in the DCAU, that is. At the very least, the salient details remain the same. Blight, Terry, submarine fight. He sinks, he was an evil corrupt businessman, this time doing many more experiments, but now he's back. Also, we need to briefly talk about the DCU, which brought him in at the end of the New 52, because DCU was after the New 52 and then transitioned into Rebirth. He was in Gotham Academy, and he used time travel to try and go back and kill Terry's dad, Warren McGinnis. Yes, they do change that one DCAU detail. I approve. Another time. Another time, my salt lives forever. The crux of Blight's arc in this series runs from issues 37 to 42. This is also the arc where Terry's memory was stolen by Falseface, and suddenly there's a new bat person running around, a bat woman. But the people call her bat girl, which is hardly surprising given that Gotham has had several bat girls in continuity at that point, and also a bat woman. But they go out of their way in this to make her called Hun and Bat Chick and other things. She's running around yelling, call me Batwoman, or my name is Batwoman all the time. It got to barbed wire levels of don't call me babe. Now this Blight is very aware that Terry is Batman, hence why he went back in time to try and kill his dad. And he's more of a mwahaha Saturday morning cartoon villain style of Blight. Speaking of dead, who are you to McGinnis? You know that Terry McGinnis is Batman. I'm the one who had his father murdered without me. Neither Batman nor you, whoever you are, would exist. This arc was written by Dan Jurgens and has a couple of artists. They also keep having the character repeat this phrase over and over again, and it seems to be meant to be profound, and it's this. Understandable. What they should have realized is radiation doesn't die. Radi- <laughs> I can't. I've read it so many times and every time I laugh. <clears throat> If we're going to be generous as to what this could mean, because radiation obviously does eventually become inert, radiation is a very clear half-life. You can chart it, there are models. Blight should even be able to calculate how much time he has left based on this. It should not be a mystery. We have the math. The thing is, the model does make it look like it just goes on to infinity, but that's more a deficiency in the model, not the idea that the molecules would never dissipate. At some point, there would be no more radiation. That's all I want to know now. What's his half-life? Radiation never dies. It dissipates. Stop lying to me, Blight. Also, despite him saying this over and over again, a huge plot point for this arc is the fact that he's dying and he needs to get a new body to transfer his consciousness into. So, he's dying, but the radiation will still be there. But he keeps saying radiation doesn't die as if it justifies him still being alive and then goes to the next scene and says, I'm dying, I need a new body. It comes across very contradictory because of how it's presented. You comprehend the problem now, don't you? Fighting me is suicide. Anyone who can kill with a touch is unbeatable. Okay, then take the glove off and touch her. End her with one touch if we're being serious about this. Like you said, Matt, radiation doesn't die. Stop it. <laughs> Please. Now, despite all this bragging, he loses, and he has to contact an ex-lover to help him with this body transference, who happens to be hanging out with the amnesiac Terry. So this means that their plan is to then put him inside of Terry's body. They have the technology. I'm also very distracted by the fact that issue 40 highlights that he has a throne. They take time to just look at it. You end up like your old man, a forgotten wilted wisp of memory. 
I thought we were friends, Constance. For God's sake, we just met. Derek and I were lovers for years. Now I'll have him back. If he comes back to me in a younger, handsomer body, all the better. Does Derek appreciate all this shade? He's standing right there. Radiation doesn't die, but its feelings can be hurt. Issue 42 is called Blight's Out. I just need you to know that. It's revealed throughout this that Blight knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman and has for some time. I know your secrets, Bruce. All of them. He easily discovered when I took control of Wayne Powers. I rifled through your records, especially the well-hidden ones. Not that well-hidden. Such as the decades-old construction project. Below Wayne Banner. I'm sure you fed the construction crew a tall tale designed to allay their suspicions. And then he just goes into the Batcave super easily. Security there, terrible. This raises a lot of questions. Chief among them, why didn't he do something about this sooner? Especially when he breaks in and makes a dramatic villain speech about how killing Bruce Wayne was all he wanted for his birthday and he has time. Again, then why not start earlier? He could have done so much damage with that knowledge. But this arc ends with Terry regaining his memories and going and sticking it to Blight. And just one more time, one more time for the road, radiation never dies. Like you said, Powers, radiation can't die, but we can bury it. It's not as clever as they think it is. I know there's someone, someone who's gonna make a relic really, like, technically. It, technically, yes, radiation isn't alive, so like technically it would not die, but again, it's not as cool as they think it sounds. And they keep contradicting that other points in the narrative, sometimes in the same issue. Cringe never dies? No, it really doesn't, because at some point that word will get out of style, and using it will then ironically become what the name means, and then it will still be alive. This arc is a bit messy and has a lot going on, and by messy I mean that it's a bit of a mishmash of lots of different ideas thrown together. This return has some of the silliest, but also strongest moments. But it does present some strong contenders for some more poignant ways you could bring Blight back and keep a lot of the elements that were in this plot. It could have done with some refinement. Since his shift in origin makes him a threat to both Bruce and Terry, there was room if one had wanted to keep him around instead of using him as an energy villain. To have him working in the shadows, discovering that not only had his plans been thwarted by one Batman, but two. Figuring out that Bruce and Batman connection later on, and then using it against him. Playing with the potential that there were other dark sites that Bruce hadn't found since there had been ones he hadn't found before. If he could make one artificial skin, why not make another one that looks like somebody else? As the creator, you control the rate of half-life. Whenever people bring him back, he's dying even more aggressively because he was melting down on the sub. But you could also play with the opposite, the idea that he's found a way to arrest it or lengthen the amount of time that he has left. If you want to keep him around longer to play with him a bit more. The Rebirth version of Batman Beyond, the comic, was trying to juggle a lot of characters as mentioned. Because it had so many pre-existing legacy characters to play with and wanted to put them inside the narrative as well. That means we're playing with Tim, we want to put in Damien, we want to put in Dick, Dick's daughter, all kinds of all these characters. So sometimes elements from the original DCAU timeline could end up being smushed. But in terms of Back from the Submarine, this is the closest it comes to really making it feel like it could have some weight. Imagine a world where this series took a bit more elements from the DCAU, but still tried the he needs a new body to transfer to. To avoid the retread, it's best not to have that be his son's body, Paxton. We already did that in the DCAU. Don't waste your contempt on me, detective. When Talia offered you youth again, you fairly drool to take it. But to have him aim for Terry, not because he knows he's Batman, but because he works for Wayne as a way to get close to him and potentially overthrow him and then gain full control of the company in the body of a healthy young man. That is still a bit of a retread of a plot from the DCAU, but it would transfer well into this rebirth arc and what they were doing, since the Al Ghouls already had stuff going on there. There's something there. You could have a lot of fun with that and still keep a lot of Blight's original core themes intact. Although, it's arguably the strongest of the Returns time of recording, at least of the ones in the main and DCAU universe. Verses. Derek Powers and the character of Blight have of course made an appearance in the Batman Beyond the White Knight story. This is part of Sean Murphy's Batman White Knight universe. He just became Blight in issue 6 of 8. Well, the accident happened in 5, but then he was full Blight in 6. Now this White Knight series plays quite liberally with DCAU continuity, but will also twist it, but it borrows quite heavily from there. Now despite the name of the series and the fact that there's a play on Batman Beyond in there, Terry is not the sole focus of this book. He's sharing it with several others. The Beyond is more that we're beyond 
the White Knight story. It's less that it's Batman Beyond. Bruce is still very much the focus. He's also having a kind of Crichton Harvey plot going on right now. Sort of, kind of. Shout out to the Farscape people who will know what I mean. <laughs> Look at the Jack in his mind. Looking slick. This series continues an interesting tradition when it comes to how Bruce Wayne lost his company, and that's that each time it happens, it makes him look worse. We had just general apathy in DCAU, then paranoia and distraction and rebirth, and now it's because he gave all his money away into charities and to be pumped into the Gotham infrastructure, but with no checks and balances in place, nothing in case anything went wrong at all. What happened to Prep Man? Where is he? We need him. What about corrupt institutions? The city was still corrupt. Sometimes giant influxes of money can cause more harm than good. It can be a very nuanced issue, especially if they're being dumped into broken infrastructures. What about keeping some of your funds just in case you can course correct if you need to? I know he was going to prison, but still, give some to other people to manage. What about theft? Well, in this case, it was a lawsuit, and Derek Powers managed to seize control of his company and his assets. Powers misattributes the funds to create a kind of paramilitary police force, which is headed by Dick Grayson, by the way. And in this universe, Terry is working for Powers, who tells him that he will help him get the man who killed his father. He's been running fetch and tote and do for him in the bat suit. As the series goes on, it's revealed that Powers knew who Bruce was and that he blackmailed him into funding him. This is a exchange for keeping his mouth shut and then he would produce some tech for him. Batman belongs to me as much as it belongs to you. How many grappling hooks did I provide over the years? How many batarangs did I sharpen? How many Batmobiles did I design? I know we never got along, but I always thought we wanted the same thing. To misattribute funds? Powers in this series is a smooth manipulator once more. He's again in that Lex-like vein. Until issue five, where Bruce reveals not only does he know who Terry is, because he knows all kinds of things, except for how to handle his own money. I'm not over it. I'm not over it. I'm sorry, the salt. I'm sorry. And he reveals that it was Powers who had Warren McGinnis killed. And the tech he's had Terry stealing isn't to improve the bat suit, but it's for a secret project. So Terry goes berserk and just starts throwing batarangs, and one hits a container that douses Powers and becomes Blight. The design here wins for the best, since the original, though. It's an update on the DCAU, but without adding a containment suit. So far, time of recording. Unless you love the suit, then this may not work for you. Issue 6 is where we get to see him getting encased in the sin, and we're not sure what the stability situation is because he blows his doctors off. And he appears in Blight form at the end and delivers quite the shot to Dick Grayson. This story is on ongoing time of when I wrote this slash recording. This version will have to go on an as it stands at the moment kind of analysis. As it stands, it's a rendition that works well for the White Knight universe. It still feels like he's heading to some kind of end, though perhaps this time not on a submarine. It's not the strongest for setting the character up as a Batman Beyond villain, but again, in all fairness, that is not the focus of this series, at least not so far. Blight is a character who provides the hero in the universe where he originally debuts with a strong arc. But one that also places Blight himself on a clear trajectory. While it's not impossible to have him return, the question then becomes why? The answer often comes back as because, in terms of Terry's roster, he is one of the more iconic and well-known villains, both in action and in design. But part of that comes from the arc he goes through, and so for him just to return without any real focus makes the character feel less significant than he does at the start, and just a bit less special as time goes on. There are things that have of course can be done with him. But for them to really land and not simply be stories that turn him into a more run-of-the-mill villain, whereas he feels more like he's being set up as an arts foe for Terry in that first run, it's difficult. Especially as time has gone on and he's been moved further and further away from Terry and more and more towards Bruce. The fact that some seem a bit stuck in a rut with him can be substantiated by how often stories either find themselves going back to his end point. Blight raises some interesting questions to ponder in the realm of comics, where in many cases the story is perpetual. Is there room for some characters in such a format to be left alone? To have their strong moment and then be replaced by others? Or must they continually be revived? Is that their lot? Is that their function? And if that is the case, how much effort does one have to put into doing so? Or are some characters just destined for one big bright arc, and then from there, some other appearances, some that stand out, some that don't? I would argue that even in the Forever story, it's okay to let some stories play out or some characters fade away. Or on the other hand, acknowledge that some characters are beholden to specific iconic moments that end up defining them. And that if one wants to work with them, they need to find a way to either work within that and find something new to do with them, or a credible and entertaining way to change that up. Because forward movement is possible, even in the forever narrative. But those are just my thoughts, and I want to hear yours. Do you completely disagree? Do you think that Blight has never been a strong villain? Meh. Or do you feel that the idea or the design were derivative? Do you feel that he was always destined for such a fate? Does radiation never die? I know my sass doesn't. Do you love Blight? The character, not when it kills your plants? Share your thoughts down below. While you're down there, please follow the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a vid. Thanks so much for taking us on our day spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.